but it is my pleasure to be able to chair this session. Uh, I've been following the conversations and the presentations that have been going on all morning. And I think that you know this session uh, addresses some of those contexts and, and comments that have been brought up and the questions that have been brought up. So it'd be lovely to um, talk about this and then move into any questions that you all have. So I think first um, I want to introduce Fernando Chisale. Uh, Fernando, oh, sorry, before that, Simone asked, you asked me to give a little introduction to myself, so apologies. Um, so I'm Tatiana Salisbury. I'm a reader in global mental health and design based at King's College London. You saw me earlier today because I do support WHO and their wider integration um, of perinatal mental health work. Uh, my own work is focused on adolescent perinatal mental health. Uh, I'm a PI of a project called Inspire, which Fernando Chisale, who is our first presenter, will be presenting on, um, which is focused in Kenya and Mozambique. I've been working in perinatal mental health for probably about six years now, um, and more widely in global mental health since uh, you know the early 2000s. So, um, without kind of making too much time, taking too much time, I want to start with our first speaker, who's Fernando Chisale. Uh, he's based at the International Center for Reproductive Health in Mozambique, where he works as a researcher and is also the project coordinator of the Inspire Project. Uh, Fernando will presenting today on the experiences of involving adolescent girls and their communities in developing a perinatal mental health intervention. Fernando, on to you. Fernando, oh, can you? Thank you. Hello, everyone. I hope you can uh, hear me. Yes, we can hear you. All right, thank you. So my name is Fernando Shisale. I will be uh, talking about involving uh, adolescents, girls, and their communities in development of, of a perinatal mental health intervention in Mozambique. So I don't know if my slide is, is moving because I'm, I'm kind of stuck, all right. Yeah, so this is a, a resume from um, Inspire Project, which is uh, implemented here in Mozambique in Tete province. And uh, it's funded by the King's College in London and it's implemented by ICRH Mozambique. So let me just do a background. Uh, why Mozambique? Because we are at, uh, ranked among the top 10 countries in the world where um, one in every 10 adolescents have uh, children uh, before the age of 15 or in uh, adolescence, uh, which happens also to be a, a, a phase of a great vulnerability in uh, mental health problems. Uh, uh, so this is why actually we, 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 uh, we, we, we are in, yeah, bringing uh, this project to, to, to Mozambique and also to the world because uh, one of of the of, 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 uh, top priority of, of, the, of our country, Mozambique, uh, um, is, is uh, preventing the teenage pregnancy. But the majority of, of the projects, uh, uh, they, they all uh, uh, focus on, on um, preventing, only preventing, but what about what happens? What happens uh, after uh, the, the girl uh, gets pregnant? Because we we we've been um, fighting to prevent, but still we have a large number of of, um, of young women getting uh, pregnant. But what happens uh, next? So Inspire is a, is about um, to 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 address the consequences or, or, or the mental consequences of of of, of early uh, pregnancy so um the the aim of of of, of this project uh, is to develop an intervention to support the well uh, the well-being of uh, uh the well-being and, and and mental health of adolescents from uh, 15 to 19 years uh of 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 age and we had two um, phases of, on this project. Project I will be sharing my experience only in in the first phase, which was the 
development of, of the of the of the intervention. In, in this first phase, we we divided in, into uh, two two moments. We had the first moment, which was the field work, where we 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 did uh, qualitative uh, research with all stakeholders, and uh, in the resume, I can say we identified the main challenges, the main uh, problems that these girls face the, uh, after they get pregnant, and then we we go to the <clears throat> to a second moment, which uh, where the developing the the, the 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 intervention we called it uh, a human centered design workshops where we sat uh, we as a, a research team we sat uh, uh, along with the all the stakeholders and we designed the idea of the intervention that we wanted to 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 to, to support the uh, our our target group so uh, we, we had uh, the girls from uh, 15 years to 19, uh, 15 to 19 years old as the main target. We had the uh, young women, the partners, we had the family, the community influencers, and also we had uh, health service uh, providers as the whole uh, stakeholders of, of this study. So we in total worked with 75, uh, 74 participants and um, all of them uh we are uh, divided into our activity of intervention, uh, of interviews, uh, focus discussion, discussion groups. We had uh, food voice and spiral works, uh, uh, works as technique, techniques. We use it to collect data in the in the field. So after we identified the the main challenges, we went uh, to sit uh, along with the uh, stakeholders and draw uh, the idea of the intervention, but we had uh, points that were driving us, uh, uh, were guiding us, uh, which he was, we wanted with the, the with the, with, with all the stakeholders to uh, to design an intervention that is accessible to, for local uh, deployment, but that is uh, attractive to the state, to, to them, to the stakeholders, is uh, aligned with the priority of the country, and it's easily also integrated to the local, uh, Health systems and mainly it's uh, linked to to the evidence. So we had something like this uh, at the end of of of, of this uh, process. But now I'm I'm going to to share what what were, were the main experience because this is what uh, what is all about uh, my presentation. Uh, using the 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 uh, human centered design, we we were able. Uh, uh, from what I saw, to break uh, barriers of 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 um, uh, how how the research is done here locally, because we we did put together uh, uh, different people from different category. We 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 brought them in the same place to think about a solution for the problems that they are facing every day. So we had. Uh, community leaders, religion uh, leaders, uh, professor service providers, uh, uh, service health service providers, and also we brought the girls or, or, or the girls of our study to to uh, to to think together about a solution of 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 this matter. So what happened here? It, it was a, a little bit of shock because in 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 our context. Yeah, yeah, these uh, people, the the service provided, the leaders, the professors, they are they are like the holders of of, of knowledge. So sometimes it's not uh, the, the 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 target of the group. They they are not giving the space to speak up what they what they think should be a solution. So we brought them all. So the difference is that we brought them also uh, to the panel and they they spoke. The girls they brought the, their own ideas and they defended it, and this is this was uh, uh, this made our workshop uh, a little bit uh, longer than we planned because it was a, a bit of shock. The the uh, with uh, the girls and all and the other participants because it, it was a, a, a life witnessing of. Uh, uh, girl em empowerment because we use it the idea that uh, we are uh, protected in, on these workshops to 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 build uh, that um, the 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 intervention we we wanted so 
there were uh, po uh, uh, positive things that we identified from all, all this work, uh, human centered design workshops we did. It's within the group uh, when they, they knew that we used the, their ideas to, 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 to design that skeleton of, of intervention that we wanted. They they started uh, they show it uh, they started feeling so happy of being part of, of that solution and they had this uh, feeling of ownership. So for 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 from our side we had uh, from our side as researchers we had a confidence of, of that our program will be successfully implemented because the people accepted it and we had also the the confidence that it will be sustainable because of this. And outside of the group that we were working with, we invited pa several partners, and they uh, they also liked the the methodology we were using, and and they even adopted it, uh, the, the methodology to to use it to their own challenges and the, and the also uh, their studies. So in the end, uh, what we learned from all this process is that uh in 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 in, con in context uh, like mozambique where uh, our country it's uh, uh it's a very important first of all uh to, 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 to when we are we want to implement a project a project to the people to, to have the ownership of, of the project because the main projects tend to 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 fail soon after they start because we don't have this uh, thing it's so important called the ownership of, of the project uh thank you that's all i had to to, to share great thank you very much fernando i don't know if you can see the video there's clapping going on although it's quite quiet on on our end here uh joining remotely thank you very much for that uh, giving some highlights as to the the challenges but also the opportunities of engaging stakeholders and engaging, uh, in this case, girls uh, in developing interventions to support their mental health. So next, I'd like to move on to uh, Kanto Rabimanjara, um, who is a Fulbright student scholar and a doctoral candidate in the PhD in clinical psychology at George Washington University. So their dissertation is focused on perinatal mental health and adversity in Madagascar, and wider research uh, addresses maternal and child uh, mental health, and also cultural adaptation of evidence-based interventions in both the US and Sub-Saharan Africa. So today, Kanto will be presenting on perinatal mental health in Madagascar. So first, Fernando, would you please um, stop sharing your screen, and then that will allow Kanto to um, share screen as well. Hello. You're on mute, just so you know. Four years in and I'm still on mute. <laughs> uh, hi everybody, it's so good to see everyone and thank you so much for having me on this uh, uh, webinar. I think it's such an important conversation to be had and um, I'm just really glad to also represent my country, This. Um, you know, small, big island in Madagascar. Um, so here, I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully everything will work out. Um, presenter mode. And I just want to make sure, do you all see the slides still or do you see my notes as well? Okay, perfect. Good thank slide. you. All right. So um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sals. Salisbury for uh, your introduction um, earlier. Um, as she mentioned, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to present on perinatal mental health in Madagascar. My name is Kantu for short, um, and I was born and raised actually um, in Madagascar, but moved to the U.S. when I was about 13 years old, and then pursued my studies here in the U.S. in psychology, and really found my passion in um, maternal mental health um, in the world of uh, also global mental health in general, uh, as part of the Mothers and Babies Lab at George Washington University as a fifth year student um, in their doctoral program. Um, so I kind of looked for opportunities and found that there's Fulbright that could fund dissertation research. And so I used that as an opportunity to go back to Madagascar to do my research, um, my dissertation research on just kind of expanding the state of our knowledge on the state of perinatal mental health 
um, because there's only been two studies so far um, in Madagascar that kind of looked into um, some of those aspects of uh, common perinatal mental disorders. So there, there was one um, that was based in Antananarivo, which is kind of the center, the capital of, of Madagascar, urban area um, that looked into prenatal anxiety. And they found that there was 42% of, of women who participated that reported um, anxiety during the, of the pregnancy. Uh, so you only looked at prenatal anxiety. And then... Um, uh, there was also another study um, that looked into postpartum depression using the EPDS um, in the south of Madagascar, southwest, uh, also an urban area uh, that looked in, at um, just the rates of PPD there and found out that there is about 10 to 14 percent who um, who were uh, reported high risk or severe depression Um according to, to the PDS. They also looked at some risk factors. And so a lot of the social determinants that that we went over the last session was also found in terms of some of the uh, risk factors in um, low educational attainment, uh, um, missing child, childbirth, antenatal care courses, um, some of those individual worries about delivery and labor. Those are some of those risk factors that were found. Um, but these two studies were only focused in urban areas. So my study I wanted to expand that a little bit more into the rural context um, and to also just kind of expand a little bit about that um, knowledge of the prevalence of, uh, of um, common perinatal disorders. So I looked at both just general mental distress and uh, depression uh, in Madagascar during the perinatal period. Um, through an exploratory mixed method study. So we're looking at two main questions, very exploratory. Um, some, what are some of the individual social cultural risk and protective factors associated with CPMD um, among Malagasy perinatal women? And what are the uh, Malagasy women's views and experiences of CPMD? So somebody asked earlier, what are some of those experiences um, and how, how to kind of conceptualize those experiences in the Malagasy context, right? So we were looking into that through a qualitative approach as well, um, just to ask them what are some of the cultural manifestation of depression or anxiety during the perinatal period. Um, but I'm gonna talk mostly about kind of our process of how this research went about and how to maybe sustain it, even though, because it's a very, um, it's the very beginning of stage of research uh, kind of as an early career right now. Um, so how to sustain that kind of research into the research phase that um, other folks are in. So developing interventions and sustaining that. Um, so I'm still in the early kind of phase and I wanted to kind of give some feedback and lessons learned about that part. Um, so it, it's important that you, uh, especially if you're coming from um, a different country, it's to, to really partner with a local university or local organization to start the work, right? Um, so when the idea came first to me as because I had to find a research project for my dissertation, um, I reached out to a depart to the Department of Psychology at um, Catholic University of Madagascar or Université Catholique de Madagascar, um, and this was just through an alumni who majored in psychology. And I was like, I'm interested in partnering. I wonder if you could connect me to one of the people there. So we reached out to more alumni and more people in the department who's done some research on parenting to brainstorm ideas. And then we got connected to uh, to research more about who are we going to partner with. So what are the who are the partner sites? I I did all of this remotely, and so we it was really important to kind of figure out what are some of those partner sites that have a focus on maternal mental health or maternal health focus, or community focus on family. So health centers in the rural context or faith based communities that have women's groups. Um, so that was kind of like our first way of um, really connecting to the community through the local university. And then through that, we were able to connect with um, actual stakeholders and, and, and people from the community as well. Uh, we also, especially for the rural context, it was um, through a connection in our own family community who knew the value of a particular church district on women's groups. So I thought that was a good way to uh, also collaborate. And um, and the reverend was really interested in collaborating. So that was our kind of um, a way to um, 
have a recruitment site and also partner with community members in the rural side. Uh, in the urban side, we were we found an all-governmental maternity clinic that was familiar with research um, and was willing to collaborate as well. So all of that happened between 2022 and 2023. And then in 2023, we secured the funding. So we started to really figure out what are some of those questions we want to get answered. So all of this was informed by kind of the, the value and the framework of community-based participatory research. Um, so really kind of involving, you know, the reverend and the, the community health volunteers to help them um, to make sure that um, we answer the questions that they want answered as well. So they were further, it was further informed by the community members. Um, and after the research was done, we recruited for about, not for about three, four months. And then we, we have pre preliminary findings that we wanted to disseminate a little bit. So here are some of the kind of main findings, I guess. 56% um, were we found of the rate of perinatal depression, um, but it was uh, significantly higher for the rural context than the urban context. And I wish I could go more into this. I know we only have a few minutes left, but I wanted to talk more about um, some of those lessons learned about the recruitment and sustaining efforts after the recruitment is done. Um, so first things first, um, community members are essential um, and they, they can play many different roles throughout the research process, which is which is what we really want. Um, they can be advisors, informants, they can be data collectors, they can help you um, analyze the data, they can be liaisons, but they are essential. They need to be involved. Um, so for example, um, in the urban and rural setting, we partner with a variety of community folks, church leaders, CHVs, lead mothers. So the wife of the deacons and the mothers in the villages um, that we worked with, they helped with from making the food for the community when we did data collection to organizing this research field day so it all goes smoothly. We could I couldn't have done that myself or even my research team. We really had to have their help with it. And it was all about collaboration and working together. Um, and cultural humility is key. I know that I was born there. I was raised there. I'm from there, but I also know my experience. A lot of it, a large part of it was from the United States as well. So coming in kind of an outsider as well, in a way. So really being open to learning about some of those specific contexts and um, how, and really open to learn from them as the, as the main storytellers are important as especially at the beginning of your research um and then dissemination of the research outreach efforts matter to the community so even though you can't really publish anything about your findings just yet maybe or anything like that it's important to still share a little bit about some of those results just so that um, you can brainstorm together future ways to collaborate as a way to sustain that partnership um, but also figuring out ways, creative ways to sustain those collaborations. For example, in the urban side, we were able to, even though we don't have any funding or anything like that, we were able to um, ask them what they needed. I know after the follow-up research, it's it's kind of, it feels wrong to just leave and be like, okay. So it's good to be like, what what can we do as a next step? So the, the urban clinic, for example, wanted to increase screening in, in Malagasy. So they asked us to see if they could pilot the PDS we used for our research for their site. And so we were able to support them that way. Um, and the same thing for the uh, rural communities as well, um, to kind of brainstorm ideas of how they can uh, sustain their current capacities. Um, so that can lead to maybe further research development, further collaboration once you know we, we have more funding secured. Um, but I wanted to just share a little bit more about that experience, uh, especially as if somebody out there is starting out their research very kind of um, in the beginning. Um, so yeah, thank you all so much for listening to me. Um, and uh, I want to thank my team in Madagascar and in the U.S. and my funders, Fulbright, Richard Walker, and my the two universities that I worked with, George Washington and uh, Catholic University of Madagascar, for um, all the efforts. And it does take a village to do all of this. Uh, it's just really nice to hear about everybody else's efforts to address maternal mental health. Thank you all so much. 
Wonderful. Thank you, Cantu. Um, that was fantastic to hear about, and thank you for providing you know, such kind of good practical explanations and descriptions of how to engage um, stakeholders with the lessons that you've learned. And um, so the next presentation is from Sara Hatupapi. So apologies again, I've been given all of these names, but I haven't had a chance to actually meet everyone. So I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing names correctly. Um, so Sarah holds a PhD in nursing science from the University of Pretoria in South Africa. And she will be presenting on the development of guidelines to manage perinatal depression in Namibia. Hi, welcome. Good morning, everyone. Uh, let me see if I can start sharing my slide. Sorry, we're we still seeing um, a screen which shows the program. Um, if you could just, oops. Uh, if you would like, we can um, share your presentation. Maybe if, if you go into share um, window instead of screen, if you try sharing again, go out and share again. And then you can choose, <clears throat> and then you click on the PowerPoint. I think you can see from your side. I'm, seems like I'm staggering to see you. Can you go out, like unshare? If you go on share screen and you go unshare. On your screen, if you move it up, yeah, if you yeah exactly move up there and then view option, that the green thing, move it up to the green thing. There should be a button to unshare. Yeah. You see, I stop sharing. Let me remove this. Okay, I think you can stop start sharing from your side. Oh. Uh, we just saw it for a second. Sorry, you just had it. Ah, oh, we thought you had it. It was you. Oh, okay. We share from our side then. Thank you, Jamal. Thank you, we will share. I can move this. Way. Yes. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, uh, and sorry for that. Uh, my name is Sarah, as I've been introduced uh, recently, and our discussion today will focus on the development of the guideline to manage perinatal depression in Namibia. And my aim to present this guideline is like I want to implement this guideline because since the development, the guideline has not been tested into the clinical setting to see its effectiveness. Can we go to the next slide? And perinatal service and perinatal assessment in Namibia. Uh, allow me to define the perinatal period in a Namibian context. Perinatal period in Namibia, it starts from the time of conception until six weeks postnatal uh, uh, following the delivery. And currently, Namibia has no perinatal mental health guideline, and the mental health services are not always readily available. What do we mean by that? Meaning that in Namibia, on our perinatal care, we focus mostly on the physical side and then on the well-being of the fetus, and we don't consider the emotional uh, well-being of our mother during this period. And however, Namibia has managed to achieve 95% of the perinatal coverage 
which is above the ratified target. And I strongly believe that with that higher enrollment in the perinatal care in many parts of the country, it offers a good opportunity to introduce guidelines to manage perinatal depression. Can, can we go to the next slide? Uh, the aim of study was just to develop guidelines to manage perinatal depression. And the guidelines were developed uh, on three phases. Phase one, it focused on a qualitative study where I interviewed women with perinatal depressive syndrome and healthcare provider. And on phase two, it was a systematic review where I reviewed the guideline used to manage perinatal depression globally. And then on phase three, it was mostly on the guideline development that was done through a nominal group techniques. Uh, can we go to the next slide? And then perinatal depression in Winduk, Namibia, because this study was conducted in Winduk, Namibia. And to identify the potential candidate for my study, I adopted the Edinburgh postnatal depression scale. And I interviewed uh, 50 pregnant women and 50 postnatal mother, aged 18 years old and above. And out of this part spent, 38 has screened positive for depression, and 34 of these women scored 10 and above on EPDS. Why do I mean here 10 and above? I put the cut off on the 10, and the reason behind was not to leave anyone with perinatal depressive syndrome. And then out of that uh, uh, sample, four of them indicated that uh, suicidal thought. And then I invited 21 women for interview. And then out of that 21, 14 had antenatal depression, while seven had uh, postnatal depression. So far, that is the only result that we have regarding uh, perinatal depression in the country or in Vindu per se. Can we go on the next slide, please? And the woman whom I interviewed with perinatal depressive symptoms, they revealed their need. And the first need was the support need, which includes social need and healthcare support need. And the second one was healthcare needs. Uh, and they revealed the need to create awareness about perinatal depression because they believe that many women, they don't know what is perinatal depression or they don't even know whether they are suffering from it. And they also said we have to sensitize the community and family member about this uh, depression. And importantly, they indicated that healthcare provider, they should now start screening for perinatal depression. And during that screening, they have to ensure privacy, uh, privacy and confidentiality. And then healthcare provider also, they have to do the follow-up visit for those women who have screened positive. Can we go to the next slide? And then on the barrier, when a healthcare provider, they revealed the barrier that prevented them, that prevented them to screen for perinatal depression, like they have a difficult in recognizing the sign and syndrome of perinatal depression. And uh, the main barrier was the lack of guideline and healthcare service approach to maternal mental health, mental health, as there are no policies regarding maternal mental health in the country, and the cultural influence it also affect it might affect the screening and the management of perinatal depression, and then again lack of community awareness regarding. Uh, perinatal depression and a shortage of healthcare provider also was some of the barrier. And then I adopted the, on a systematic review, I adopted the Center of Perinatal Excellence that is COP 2017, effective mental health care in the perinatal period. And that was an Australia clinical uh, practice guideline and that was adopted into the Namibian context. 
and the aim was this guideline was developed for some Australian women that they have same characteristic with a Namibian uh, uh, context. And then on the development, I presented the finding of phase one and two to the uh, healthcare provider and the panel expert through nominal group. And we come up or we develop the guideline together through that uh, nominal group techniques. And we go to the next slide. And uh, I came up with the eight uh, guideline. And because of the time, I'm not going to go through the guideline, but that is the eight guideline that I developed in that study. And on conclusion, as I said earlier, that the aim of attending this workshop is to me to learn on how to implement this guideline, because up to now, they have not been implemented into the perinatal care setting. And therefore, I think there is a need to implement, evaluate the effectiveness and the sustainability of this guideline, if I learn from the expert, those that have implemented the guideline into maternal mental health care. And this will be the first step in the country to train the healthcare provider at the primary healthcare setting on how to screen, detect, and manage perinatal depression. And this will close the gap on the perinatal uh, mental health in the country. I thank you. Great, thank you very much, Sara, for that excellent presentation. It was lovely to hear that whole um, process that you've taken. Um, so just for everyone's benefit, we will have, I think we'll have some good healthy time for a Q&A after all of the presentations have been completed. Um, also, if you have any questions and you're online, please feel fr free to put them in the Q&A section um, of Zoom or within the webinar chat. Uh, and I will be going through those with Nicole as we get into the Q&A section. All right. So I'll move on to our last presentation of this session. Um, you can already see Svetlana uh, on the screen. So Svetlana uh, Drivdal is uh, an early childhood development and maternal mental health consultant at PATH. Um, for the last decade, she's been supporting the integration of early childhood development and maternal mental health promotion into health services and key Ministry of Health guidelines within Mozambique, Kenya, and Ethiopia. There's a lot of overlap in terms of working, which is quite nice. Um, today, she'll be sharing with us lessons learned from integrating the management of perinatal depression into routine services in Mozambique. So over to you, Svetlana. Thanks very much, Tanya. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you and we can see your slides. I was very happy to join this uh, or symposium because I liked the premise. It's really to ask questions and kind of pose challenges. So I hope I'll be able to bring some challenges, not only successes. So I'm going to talk about work in Mozambique, uh, where, as in many countries that we just discussed, um, really screening and management of mental health uh, issues is happening at the higher level, at the specialist level. And so the challenge we were trying to do is really to bring it to the primary healthcare level, level of maternal and child health services. And just to link the dots, I'll be talking about the pilot that Alicia Carbonell in the morning uh, referred to as a pilot in Mozambique, which is now used um, uh, by WHO to scale up in other provinces. So in 2019, MOH requested past technical assistance to really pilot uh, PHQ-9, the tool that they've chosen um, for primary healthcare settings and to see whether it would work um, in maternal and child health services. Uh, we've agreed to provide that support, but really wanted to link it to counseling as well because we thought it wasn't enough to just, um, uh, just screen. And so we worked in Southern Mozambique uh, in two rounds of piloting, which eventually took us to five healthcare facilities, uh, where we trained all MCH nurses and all available mental health technicians, which are usually present in urban and peri-urban um, health facilities. And what we really tried to do is to make it as easy as possible for the, for the nurses. So uh, when we looked at the tool that we would give to them, we tried to make it similar to the tools they already know. 
In this case, case it's the integrated management of childhood illnesses. Um, and really try to, I can actually show you the next page to make it easier to see. So those of you who maybe work in uh, child health might recognize uh, this type of um, tool, which has like three or four columns, observe and ask, signs and symptoms, classify and treat. So we kind of use this approach or this model, but uh, presented information on mat um, maternal depression, prenatal depression. So when we started, just to go back, um, we really started on postnatal care, but then later added antenatal care on the request of the nurses themselves and started with PHQ-9, but then <laughs> ended up going with PHQ-2 in the second round because we realized that it was too long for the nurses and really they did not have time to apply the whole PHQ-9 uh, questionnaire to the, um, to the mothers. Um, for the counseling, we worked with Thinking Healthy program that you already heard about uh, and its adaptations in two countries that we had access to, Turkey and Pakistan but also informed the counseling content by in-depth interviews we had with BNC clients as we were designing the intervention. So you can see that I'm coming from childcare <laughs> or uh, ECD background, because if you look at the risk factors, we not only checked for the typical risk factors such as unwanted pregnancy or domestic violence, but also looked at uh, mother-child interactions, which is often a sign you could see um, potential problems in terms of depression by the way the mom reacts or doesn't react to the baby. And also looking at interest in breastfeeding. So you will see that risk factors have been a bit extended. Um, in PHQ2, again, we had some issues because we realized that the questions, the way they were, were a bit unclear for the mothers. So we had to um, rewrite them basically. First of all, we had to explain what losing interest means. So you can see in red here, it gives some examples, um, what kind of activities mother might have enjoyed before and has stopped enjoying or lost interest in. And also kind of broke the question down into two parts. First, we would ask whether she has, uh, whether it happened that she has lost interest in her everyday activities. And then if so, how, or how frequently uh, it happened? Because if you asked it all in one question, basically women got confused. So you had to break the question into two parts. Um, and then we, when we provided um, pathways for treatment, we would always make sure that uh, nurses remember to register what they have identified, remember to counsel and remember to refer. Uh, so here are just uh, cards or examples of cards that we used for counseling. You can see that we are basically, unfortunately it's in Portuguese, <laughs> but you can see uh, in the pictures that we are trying to address the same domains that you might know from Thinking Healthy Manual, which looks at three domains, uh, mother self-care, which is the first column, uh, mother relationship with a baby, and then mother relationship with a partner, which is on the next page. And we always used, um, tried to kind of portray negative and positive scenarios by using black and white versus colorful uh, pictures and really promote behavior activation. So what is happening on the first picture? What's happening on the second picture? Where do you see yourself? Uh, and what? how can you move if you are stuck kind of on one side, how can you move to the other side, right? Uh, really kind of giving a bit of homework to the mom and encouraging her to try specific actions. Uh, when we talked about relationships with others, based on our experience, we ended up splitting it into two parts. One is related with a partner, because that came out as a very prominent uh, domain of concern for many mothers. And then relationship with others, such as friends or neighbors or other family members. So we ended up splitting them into two, two separate domains. Um, and then basically we tried to assess to what extent these tools were feasible, acceptable to the nurses, and whether they actually resulted in detection of uh, um, prenatal depression. So what we have found, as I said, there were some successes and some challenges. So we did find the tools to be very feasible and acceptable to the nurses. They actually surprisingly said that they do believe it's part of the job and they felt very natural uh, talking to mothers uh, about their feelings and really trying to offer support. Um, at the same time, there were some barriers such as nurse rotation, lack of privacy, there are many counselors and others coming in and out of the rooms. So that doesn't help, but overall nurses felt it was part of the job and they felt it was relatively easy to use a protocol for the management of depression. Uh, so here we also have pretty positive results in terms of the proportion of women being screened. We see that majority was screened at, at antenatal care, a bit less at postnatal care, which we questioned. And by observing and talking to the nurses, understood that 
PNC is quite a busy touch point. The baby is there, lots of stuff has to be done with the baby, so <laughs> screening goes down. And you see the difference in register data and client reports. So if you talk to the mothers, fewer of them say that they've been screened as opposed to checking the, <laughs> the register reports, which I think is uh, to be expected. Uh, so here we will have some challenges. Um, you know, we just heard very high depression rates identified in Madagascar and some other countries. Uh, we had very low depression uh, detection rates. It's between one and 3% of women identified by the nurses. Uh, remember that nurses are not professional data collectors, right? They're doing a lot of other things and at the same time, trying to apply PHQ2 and check for risk factors. Uh, however, the, the cases that they identified, most of them were confirmed by mental health providers as cases of depression. Um, so, so, the, so the identification was, was real, the cases were real. And so we are trying to think like why it could be like that. Uh, we have data from central Mozambique which shows when um, trained data collectors were using the same tool they actually didn't have much higher <laughs> detection rates. It was about 6%. So we're kind of, okay, maybe we're not so lost. <laughs> maybe that's the reality. And the reality could be because of different reasons. First of all, if you look at the data below, uh, rates of attendance of these touch points are not so high. You know, it's about half, 50% um, of women come to ENC and then about third of women come to the postnatal care uh, services. And then there are many other issues such as interpersonal communication skills of the nurses and just the nature of consultation, which is a bit rushed. So we're not surprised, but at the same time, we want to find out what, <laughs> what to do better and how to improve it. Um, and this is my final slide. So in terms of communication, when we asked the mothers how they felt being asked by the nurses about the uh, psychological state, the emotions, uh, they felt they were comfortable talking to the nurses and they perceived the nurses to be warm and communicative. However, we did see that nurses struggled with counseling. It was easy for them to, easier for them to question the nurses, the, the mothers than to counsel. They're a bit lost with the cards, even though we thought they were quite simple. <laughs> Ended up just asking the mom, like, where do you belong? Are you in this situation or in that situation, right? Um, and struggled to select the right domain for counseling. Do I focus on relationship with the, with the father or with a baby or self-care? So our question is then, do we expect too much from the nurses? Should counseling be delegated to mental health providers? But then what do you do in cases where there are no mental health providers, you're not in an urban area? So do you still want the nurse to do basic uh, light touch, like first aid counseling? Um, so I think that's it for me. Thank you so much. Great, thank you, Svetlana. Uh, and thank you to all of our presenters um, for some excellent presentations today. Um, I think you know a lot of the focus around this is around stakeholder engagement and what impacts that has uh, on intervention and guideline development and implementation. So I know that we've gotten, we've gotten a few questions online. I'm sure there's probably some questions in the room as well. So maybe what I'll do is I'll start with a question that has been given online and that will give time for the room to identify anyone who has questions. So one of the, the first questions um, is uh, from Annette Bauer uh, online. And I think this would be, I, I think this, this initially came from Fernando's presentation, but actually, could be open probably to every speaker on, on this panel, every presenter. So the question or, or the comments would be around understanding what the experiences and the learnings around managing power dynamics and ethical challenges, particularly of having these different types of stakeholder groups all together and engaged in making decisions about um, what happens in terms of intervention development. So maybe I'll first start with Fernando and then see if anyone else on the panel has anything to say. If everyone on the panel, if you're able to put your cameras on, that would be fantastic so that everyone can see us. I realize that we're all a virtual panel. Um, and so it'll be nice for the people in the room, but also for everyone else who's joining virtually to be able to see someone other than me <laughs> and Nicole on the screen. Janet, Fernando, could, you repeat, could you repeat the question for Fernando? Just sure. So it would be, what have we, what have you learned about managing power dynamics and any ethical challenges? 
I can too. Fernando, are you there? Yes, yes. Fantastic. Did you hear the question? All right. Yes, yes, uh, I understood now. Uh, can I go now, responding? All right, so uh, one of, of, of the points that uh, I have to say is that uh, in, in our context here in Mozambique, for example, it's not usual to, to, to put together the, uh, for example, uh, uh, women and uh, men or maybe young girls and uh, other stakeholders to discuss about uh, sexuality and all this uh, health, uh, all these uh, matters that we, we, we did uh bring in in our, in our study so uh when we uh we use it uh, uh our 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 uh, uh the human centered design on our study it was it was like uh like a, a shock uh for the for the the, the for for the way uh, the studies are, are conducted but it, it ended up uh, at the end we 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 and also the participant uh, uh, saw that it's uh, it was a, an important uh, innovation uh, uh, for for the for the for the sustainability of the project, and we can see now as we are we we, we are doing the the pilot testing that it was it was a, a good uh, uh, experience. So I don't know if uh, that can answer the the question. Or... Yes, thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Fernando. Kentu, did you have anything that you wanted to add to that? Sure. Um, I think especially for um, the context of Madagascar, there hasn't been a lot of um, research participation for, from stakeholders, for example, especially in the rural settings. So we really had to figure out ways to um, make sure there's no undue influence, especially in terms of compensation or anything like that. So we had to consult with different different types of um, community, you know, health providers and also faith-based communities to make sure what are what can we do, for example, for um for when we when we were doing like a research field day, um, we couldn't give any kind of compensation for undue influence but they were like oh we should have like a community lunch so everyone can you know once they're done with their questionnaires we can have a um can all have food together so that was kind of the extent to which we were not and I would not have known that unless I was consulting with them and open to kind of what they said but in the urban clinic it was kind of different where they were a little bit more open to um maybe having some kind of transportation vouchers or something like that since it's a different contexts. So yeah, really kind of consult with your with the people, local people, um, to to manage those ethical guidelines and, and come together with a solution that is appropriate to the culture. That's great. And I think for the Inspire project, another thing that we we learned kind of adding on to Fernando's response was that when those stakeholder groups happened where we brought multiple stakeholders together, having a group uh, working together that was just the girls, where they could come up with their own ideas and then present to the larger group was a lot easier than having one or two girls in a larger group with a bunch of adults. Um, and then they might have been drowned out or felt really self-conscious about uh, providing their, their input. So that was another way and making sure everyone understood the purpose and why it was important to have these different perspectives um, as part of that um, intervention planning and development phase. Thanks, I'll pause there and see, go to Nicole. Yeah, thanks Tatiana. We have questions in the room as well. We have a first question from Wendy. Yes, thank you, Michelle. and this is Wendy. Um, thank you very much for all these really interesting presentations about adaptation and contextualization and moving up to guidelines. Um, my question is about, so this is very uh, time intensive, right, to do this right. And my question is related to uh, what should we do when we want to scale up? So how, how far can we go by stretching what has been found in these local contexts to other areas? Uh, or And when is it time to again do a similar exercise? So could you share your thoughts on that? Just pause there and see if anybody in the presenters have a comment on that.
Okay, so maybe I will I will take this as a as just a general thing around the Inspire project and what we've learned. So when we did our um, kind of formative work of just trying to understand what the problems were, we didn't know working in Mozambique and Kenya whether or not we would come up with one intervention or two, and we were open to that. But actually, a lot of the information that came through um, was similar. So you know what were the problems that the adolescents identified, which was they didn't know what was happening to their bodies or what was happening in terms of their baby's development. They wanted to have support from other people. Um, they didn't know how to take care of a baby. Um, they didn't know what was going to happen to them for the future and thinking around those things. So these kind of key things came up across both countries. And actually, I think, you know, it's, it's not a big leap to think that these are challenges that a girl who finds herself pregnant in you know anywhere in the world would come up against. So the intervention that came out of that, I think, is something that generally addresses those main core components of problems and issues that the girls would have. Now, whether or not the, you know the the delivery of that and maybe some of the scaffolding interventions addressing some very contextual issues might be very important. Um, and so that might have to be adapted based on where you are. Um, but in terms of, of scaling and thinking around that, I think the core for this intervention, the core pretty much stays the same. And it is really thinking about what are the contextual differences in terms of delivery and maybe some, some little content changes. Nicole, is there, are there more questions? I think we said we might alternate. Do you, do you want to have, I think there was another question on the, on the Q&A. Yes. So one was from Victoria about the issues that adolescents identified. So I've just kind of talked about that as well. So hopefully that has, has dealt with that question that Victoria had. Um, then there's another one that was asking about the guidelines. So I think this is addressed to Sara. Um, about, about I think that last slide where she had the guidelines up went very quickly. So I don't know if that's something that people want to address. I think that would be really nice to see them or if she could repeat them because I had the same thought it would be really nice. Um, uh, I think maybe for time reasons, Sarah, could you maybe just tell us what the guidelines are? Talk us through briefly. Oh. We can try. Oh, she's doing it. Oh, she's doing it. They are. Okay, it's working. It's the last. Oh, you did it. There we go. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, can you unmute yourself, Sarah? And um, do you want to talk us through? Shall we? Okay, let's quickly go through the guideline. And as I said, I developed eight guidelines regarding the management of perinatal uh, depression. Uh, the first guideline, it has to do with the pre-request before screening for perinatal depression. And there we were talking about uh, informed consent uh, privacy that we have to ensure the woman about the privacy and conf confidentiality. And guideline two, healthcare provider should screen for perinatal depression using a validated tool. In this uh, context, uh, healthcare provider, they preferred uh, the tool that is being uh, translated into a, a Namibian what, uh, 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 context or in the, into the local language, uh, which is, I find it a little bit uh, difficult because it clearly, it needs, uh, 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 it has a lot of work to do. And during this implementation, I'm trying to adopt the EPDS as it, it is. And may, maybe later, I will see if I can come up with a, a short tool. And then on guideline three is the integrate in screening for perinatal depression and assessment of psychosocial risk factor. 
they believe that we cannot only screen for perinatal depression, and we have to also consider some of those psychosocial risk factors. And there we need another tool to screen this uh, psychosocial risk factor. And guideline four, it has to do again with uh, a cultural appropriate uh, screening tool uh, during screening and uh, assessment of psychosocial risk factor. And again, they are demanding that the tool should be uh, cultural appropriate so that the patient can express, express themselves uh, 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 normally. And at line five, it has to do with the management of perinatal depression. And there, uh, we are going to use a different psychosocial intervention that are used uh, to manage perinatal depression. And during this guideline uh, development, I, uh, I didn't touch on a pharmacological intervention, but I only focused, focused on psychosocial intervention, like uh, counseling and other many that are being used. And line six, uh, it focuses on assessing women with or at risk of suicide. And on guideline seven, again, we have to have a clear uh, referral pathway. On guideline eight, it has to ensure the acceptability and disability, the integration of this perinatal mental health in primal healthcare setting. I think this one mostly is talking more into the government if clearly they can provide resources needed to integrate this guideline so that they will be uh, acceptable and so on. Great, thank you, Sarah. Nicole, is there are there any other questions in the room? Yeah, we have some more questions. Um, I'm not sure, maybe I'm, I'll speak next to this and put the microphone away. Um, so I have a question for Svetlana and maybe also for, for you, Tatiana, or the other speakers. Um, and so we've been discussing a little bit in the lunch break um, with participants here and also myself sort of thinking about these things in my own work in India on perinatal mental health is how so what came out of, of Svetlana's presentation and um, the adaptation sort of or how do we go into a context when there's very little um conceptualization of mental health essentially a very different one and we come with often western concepts or we come with some concepts and sort of asking women about their mental health might not be something they're familiar with and that might may or may not be, be linked to low detection rates when we screen, it might relate to training of healthcare workers. It might, I think a lot probably relate to stigma that we see and, and but also finding the right words and, and how we talk about things. Um, and so I guess my question would be if Svetlana or anyone else would like to share if or what they've done for um, essentially making sure that we're talking about the same thing when we are, you know, when we're trying to assess women, when we're trying to screen um, in the first place and to to get the healthcare workers and yeah, or, or if maybe if that was not so much the problem, then how how did they work with the stigma and might that be related or not? Um, yeah, because I, I saw in Thinking Healthy also, this is something that's um, almost taken as a given, so sort of, or it may be pre-work to be done before. Um, so yeah, would love to hear, thanks. I can maybe start, I don't also have the answer. I'm, I'm in the seeking group, <laughs> we're trying to understand. Yeah, um, I first of all, I don't think we've encountered stigma as such because we've tried to really focus on like maternal well-being, right? And not to use the term depression and encourage nurses not to use the term depression either. You know, and really talking about mother's feelings, like somebody said, focus on feelings, right? How you are feeling and really talking about supports that she has or she doesn't have, right? Um, and, uh, but I think what really, because what I've noticed, honestly speaking, is that when our team would come and sit with a nurse and observe her 
screen and then once in a while we would come in and try to screen in, in her in her um kind of instead of her right we would invariably find women <laughs> who are classified uh, with signs of depression right however when we leave for a month and we come back there are very few cases identified so you almost feel like you know do the nurses really go through the trouble of doing it right or they're doing it when a supervisor is there a mentor is there right um so i think that's one issue you know like do the nurses actually do it when nobody's there watching them? <laughs> and then second issue for me is interpersonal communication. You know, I watched the beautiful videos that Simone shared uh, in her seminar earlier. Um, this type of skills, nurse talking in such a way, the mom, the mom actually wants to open up and share what she experiences. I think that's pretty rare. And my question is how do we train nurses or how we support maybe their own mental health for them to be so sensitive? And responsive to needs of women in terms of their own mental health. So yeah, those are the, still the questions, not no, no specific answers yet. Thanks. I think maybe Nicole kind of addressing that is the same. I think the same thing we used as a method of not talking about mental health challenges, but really talking just about what are the challenges that you're experiencing during this time, or what challenges are girls experiencing, and how does that impact on them in terms of their feelings, in terms of behaviors, and, and using it that way rather than framing it as a mental health condition or an issue, um, which might be understood or misunderstood in certain ways. Um, and, you know, I think what Svetlana was talking about around, it, you know, who is doing this? And I think this goes into Ellen had a question um, in the Q&A around their you know, provider's attitudes might be that they want to do these things, but really the logistics and the practicalities of it make it very difficult for them to include it into their working. And so really thinking about, I think, you know, we all want to say like, add this, add that, but there's only, we have a time, you know, these, these women have a, a time limit as to what an appointment length is and what they can do. And so really trying to then think about, well, what are all of the things that they're having to do and where could this fit in? Or does it not fit in here? Could it be somewhere else? You know, earlier in the discussion, we were talking about that these things don't have to be done in a healthcare facility, not all of it. And so what can be outsourced to other areas? What can we do in order to just make sure that um, you know, we're using the resources that we have in community as well as in the health, health facility um, as smartly you know, and intelligently as, as possible to make sure that we can provide this kind of care and these services that we know are definitely needed. Thanks, Tatiana.